Good day to you, friends. It's a privilege for me to share this message with you this morning at the Cape Conference camp meeting. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from Luke chapter 6, a very famous parable, Luke 6, verses 46 through 49. Let us hear the word of the Lord as recorded in the New International Version. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? I will show you what he is like who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice. He is like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but could not shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. May the Lord add his blessing and understanding to the reading of his word. Let's bow our heads as we open in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will give us understanding this morning. I ask that your Holy Spirit will be our teacher. Speak to our hearts is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, can there be any doubt that we are living in the end times, or the last days, as the Bible says? Jesus is soon to come. In the stream of time, we are living in the very toenails of that great image as described in Daniel chapter 2. We see all the biblical signs being fulfilled around us, an increase in pestilences and pandemics, natural disasters and global warming with their frightening consequences are a real concern, an increase in crime, violence and corruption as in the days of Noah, moral decay, evil and wickedness as in the days of Sodom. Overpopulation, malnutrition, and growing poverty, social disorder, political instability, and economic uncertainty abound in our world. World leaders are perplexed, unable to find solutions to the challenging problems that are facing our world today. There is a general feeling of uncertainty and hopelessness with regards to the future. It is as if the carpet has been pulled out from under our feet. Dear friends, the second coming of Jesus and the establishment of his kingdom of glory and righteousness is indeed the only hope for planet Earth. Now, my friend, what would you do if I told you that Jesus was coming to your house to have lunch with you at 1 p.m. tomorrow? What would you do? Well, the ladies would probably go to the refrigerator to see what they have. They would probably turn to their recipe books to see what it was that Martha used to prepare for Jesus. Men would probably wash their cars and help their wives vacuum the house. Indeed, there would be a lot of preparation involved. Now, as Adventists, we should be preparing the world and indeed ourselves for Christ's second coming. This is what the word Adventist means. 
as a denomination, we exist because of this hope. We do not exist, my friends, because of the General Conference or the Union or the Cape Conference. No, the opposite is true. It is because Jesus is coming soon that these structures and the church as a whole exists. But there are many of us who are wondering what is going to happen to the Adventist church and to Christianity in general. Is the church going to go through? Are we really God's last day people? Will we be ready when Jesus comes? Dear friends, I would like to remind you of Revelation 19, verses 6 to 7. John the Apostle had no question about whether the church would be ready. In his vision, the Apostle heard the loud voice of a large multitude. It's not just a few people. It's a convincing shout of a great multitude like the sound of many waters. Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt Him and give Him glory. Why? Why exalt Him? Why give Him the glory? For the marriage of the Lamb has come and His bride his church, his people has made herself ready. Brothers and sisters, here is the conclusion of the matter. The church will be ready. Whether you and I are ready is another matter. But the question that we really want to ask ourselves today is what does it actually mean to be ready? How do you prepare yourself for the second coming of Christ? Do you go to the refrigerator? Do you consult the recipe books? Do you shine your shoes? Do you vacuum the house? You know, when I prepare to go on a long journey, I usually have a long list of things that I need, that is needed for the trip, not so. I want to make sure that when I reach my destination that I have my toothbrush and my shaver and the correct clothes with me. Preparation is certainly required. But how? How exactly do you prepare for the second coming? What do you need in your suitcase? How do you get ready? Friends, today I would like us to focus on an important aspect of preparation that Jesus himself emphasized. Luke 6, 46 to 49, which we read earlier, is a very well-known parable. And remember, Jesus was a carpenter, so he obviously knew much about building. Now, friends, building a house is like building character. And so that when the storms of life strike us, we will not give up on our faith. It is your character that you are now busy building that will determine whether you will make it or not. Here in this parable, we have the story of two men, both are building a house. Both are Adventists, both of them preparing for the second coming of Christ. Both believe that they should prepare. Both see world events taking shape around them. Both believe that Jesus is coming soon. Both believe that there is a certain amount of preparation that needs to be done. The first man decides to build his house on solid rock. Now, friends, it's not easy to do that. I imagine husband and wife coming together. The wife wants four bedrooms. And the husband says, 
We can only afford two. And so they compromise and agree on three bedrooms. That's what good marriages do. They compromise. And so they draw up the plans, look at the costs, and how much money they will be able to loan from the bank. This couple sat down, planned carefully, and then began doing the work. First, they had to dig the foundation. But digging foundations in Palestine, my friend, is no joke, no picnic. You only have a very thin layer of soil, and under it is solid granite rock. And so after careful planning, he started digging and digging. And once the digging was done, then the chiseling began. And remember, there were no pneumatic drills in those days. And chiseling in the hot Middle Eastern scorching sun is very, very hard work. It took a long, long time, much sweat, back-breaking effort, and commitment to the task. And it took money. The further they progressed, the clearer it became that the house would not have a balcony. It would not have beautiful decorations, because money and time were being invested in the foundations. They continued working. And the original plans became smaller and smaller. In the end, it was a very ordinary building. There wasn't much money left for finer decorations. Most of it went into the foundations. The roof was fine. The walls were fine. Everything was fine. But nothing fancy. There was simply no money left for anything fancy. The other fellow thought very differently. It made no sense to him to bury all his money into the foundations. He decided to have five bedrooms, three bathrooms, a large balcony, fancy decorations both inside and out, a large swimming pool, and air conditioning. He wanted everything of the best. And so he started working, not where the rock was, but in sandy soil. After all, sand is just made up of tiny particles of rock, isn't it? And so he started digging. And within two days, his foundations were laid. Just a little bit of foundation. Not too deep, but just enough. More important to him was the structure. And so he poured all his money into everything else. He fitted the most expensive carpets and crystal chandeliers. His building was complete bef before the other guy had even finished his foundations. But the rainy season was soon at hand. And as he was lazing on his large balcony one day, basking in the sunshine, he thought of how foolish the other guy was, still digging and chiseling. Both houses looked quite secure while the weather was good. But Palestine is known for torrential rains that turn dry wadis into raging torrents. Only a storm would reveal the quality of the work of the two builders. Dear friends, those who pretend to have faith but have a mere intellectual commitment are foolish builders. When the storms of life come, their structures fool no one. And least of all, they certainly do not fool God. The wise man had just finished building his house when the rains began to fall and the winds started to blow. To begin with, everything seemed fine. 
But for long hours the rain poured down, and the river that was not very far away began to rise. Very soon it overflowed its banks, and the water began creeping closer to the houses. But a house is a sturdy structure, and he was not too concerned. All of a sudden, the house became an island. It wasn't very long, and the house became a swimming pool. The torrent of water welcomed itself in. Large cracks appeared as the foundations began to move, and eventually the entire house collapsed. Barely did this man escape. He managed to swim across to his neighbor's simple yet sturdy home and found refuge there. Brothers and sisters, your and my characters are the houses we are building. And as we build our character, we are preparing ourselves for the Lord's second coming. But how? How do you build your character on solid rock? And we know, of course, who the rock is. The rock is is Jesus. But how do you build character on Jesus Christ when he is up in heaven? How do you build character when there are no physical bricks to build with? What are the bricks that build character? How do you build a character that Jesus will recognize when he comes? A character that will see us through the winds and the storms of life. Well, Jesus tells us how in verses 46 and 47. He says there are two types of Christian. And we need to ask ourselves which type we are. There are those who go regularly to church, return their tithes, endeavor to keep the Ten Commandments, and are involved in the life of the church. They are good solid citizens but then something happens in their life a sickness a problem in their business a divorce or a child that goes astray that beautiful young boy or girl all of a sudden taking drugs no longer interested in spiritual things the rains fall the winds blow and like a castle made of sand, their Christianity comes tumbling down. That Christian who seemed so strong was a good leader, so eloquent. He always knew exactly what to say and how to pray. That lady who could touch others with a beautiful singing voice. Everything appeared so good on the outside. But when the rains came and the strong winds blew, everything collapsed. When trials and persecution moved in, that beautiful house with its ornate decorations fell down and collapsed. And friends, it is often the biggest house that experiences the greatest fall. Often the most respected person falls the hardest. Why? Why does this happen? Because these people read and hear the gospel and all that Jesus taught, but they do not internalize it. Like the seed sown on rocky ground, it doesn't take root in their lives. Or like the seed sown amongst the thorns, the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it out. They do not allow God to conform their inner lives to the teachings of Christ. 
It's all external decorations, all on the outside. And it's usually decorations that they themselves have built. But there is another kind of person preparing for the second coming of Christ. They also read the word of God. They also know that they should be faithful. But there is nothing fancy about them. Deep down in their heart of hearts, they are simple, down-to-earth, genuine people. They do not try to impress others because they know that success all the external decoration, such as degrees and qualifications, status, position in society, a big bank balance, nice fancy cars, cannot withstand the wind and the rain. These are not essential parts of our character. The house built on anything else but Christ, as foundation, will not be able to resist the storm. However, those who spend much time investing their energy, their spiritual gifts and their talents, not on externals, but they put instead the words of Jesus into practice, as we read in verse 47, they are building their foundation on the rock. They are wise and will stand through the storm. So what are these bricks we need in our character? What do we need in our suitcase? These Christians, when they read Matthew 5, blessed are those who are meek, they realize that this is not for their neighbor, but for themselves. And they try to understand what meekness is, what kind of words and deeds match their Lord's meekness. When they read, blessed are the merciful, they know that they need to be kind and merciful towards others. They realize the importance of forgiveness. That we don't lose our greatness when we are humble and forgiving towards those who have wronged us. They know that meekness and mercy belong not only to the pulpit on Sabbath. These are virtues that belong to the home and to the daily workplace on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays as well. There is nothing fancy about these people. They may not have many talents, but they do have sturdy characters. People, people on whom you can count. Trustworthy people. People of integrity. People who do not only hear the words of Jesus, but put them into practice. These are people who do not just keep the thou shalt nots of the Ten Commandments. Rather, they have the principles of the law written within their hearts. And that, of course, is the new covenant relationship. These principles are the one as taught by Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount. Love, respect, and loyalty to God, and love and concern for our fellow human beings. It is not the letter of the law, but the principles of the law that, they, that are important to them. When they read, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they realize that it is better to be a victim of injustice than to be the cause of it. When they plan their day, their work, and their relationships with others, they do so on the basis of God's fairness and justice. If they have employees, they treat them justly and with respect 
and pay them an honest wage. When they read, blessed are the peacemakers, they act as peacemakers. When they have an argument with someone, their reaction does not depend on what he or she said, but on what Christ would have done or said in that particular situation. Peacemakers. When they read, blessed are the pure in heart, they desire a Christ-like purity of character. They are selective in what they read and watch because they know that certain things pull them away from the rock. And they know that this is not something that concerns their brother or sister. This is a matter between them and their God. And they realize that these are not things that should be done in five or ten or twenty years' time. But now, why? Because the rainy season and strong winds are coming. A time when angels will no longer hold back the winds of strife. And character will stand only if it is rooted in the practice and not just the theory of Christianity. Let the strong winds blow. Let the heavy rains fall. These people, my friends, they will stand because they are genuine and sincere in their faith. They have the fruit of the Holy Spirit in their lives, men and women on whom Christ can count. These are people, not angels. They have weaknesses, yes. But they are forgiven. And their attitude is one of wanting to please God. You cannot buy them or sell them. They are modern day Daniels. They are, they are the same at all times. These are people whose beauty doesn't depend on how they look but on who they are. These people stand for God, even though the heavens fall. And friends, there are people like this in God's church today. Praise God for that. They bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, a pure, righteous, peacemaking character. They cooperate with the Holy Spirit and bring forth His fruit Love, peace, an inner peace, joy, goodness, kindness, patience, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is the picture of men and women who do not only hear and read the words of Christ, but put his teachings into practice. Not just hearing the word or hearing the truth, but walking in the truth. To do anything else, my friend, would be self-deception. They are not unhappy people. In fact, they are inwardly very happy, for they have inner peace and an inner joy. They may not have much, or they may. That's not the important issue. What is important is that they have spent time in getting to know their God. And because of that, they are humble, down to earth, genuine and sincere people. People who practice what Jesus taught. 1 Peter 3 verses 3 to 4. I quote, your emphasis should not be on the outside. Let it be in the hidden person. In other words, the foundation. That's where we should spend our time, our money, and our priorities. Not the facade, not the brickwork, but the hidden person of the heart, says Peter. The unfading beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit 
which is of great worth in God's sight. The degrees, the qualifications, the houses, the cars, the bank balance, these are all external decorations. Now, friends, I'm not saying that these are unimportant, but they are not what prepares us for the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is the inner person, our character, that prepares us. Human glory, applause, money, position, status, power. No, it's what's inside. It's the imperishable jewel of a gentle and a quiet spirit. I'd like to end with an illustration. Zubin Mehta was a well-known orchestral director or conductor in Europe. In 1965, he was invited to direct the Prague Symphony Orchestra and the Choir. He arrived a week in advance so that he could practice with both the orchestra and the choir. He was to perform at the Christmas festival in St. Mark's Cathedral. And finally, the big day arrived. Everything was ready. The orchestra and the mass choir were in their place. Zubin Mehta came out onto the stage, this huge stage, and was awed by the size of the audience. More than 8,000 people. Only the members of the diplomatic corps were given chairs. And they were seated in the front two rows. The rest, 8,000 people, were all standing. He made his way to the center of the stage. And he bowed to the audience. But nothing happened. No clapping. He thought to himself, you know, these Prague's, do they know what etiquette is? Don't they know who I am? He turned towards the orchestra and they started performing. The music was beautiful, out of this world. Majestic. And when they had completed that piece, he turned around and bowed to the audience. But you could hear a pin drop. There was no applause. He thought to himself, man, this is very strange. It must be their culture. But maybe this is good for me. Maybe I need to learn something from this. Could it be, dear friends, that I am a Christian, an elder, a deacon, a deaconess, a Sabbath school teacher, whatever, because of the applause, because I like to receive the praise? Is this my motivation for taking up certain positions in the church? Well, eventually it was time for the intermission. And Zubin Mehta was very, very puzzled. What kind of tastes do these people have? What should, I, what should I do to get them to clap? After the interval, he continued through the second half of the program and finally got to the very last piece of music, which was the most majestic the most beautiful. And when the performance had ended and everything was done, he once again made his final bow to the audience. But then again, there was total silence. No applause. Not a single sound. The diplomatic corps was ushered out 
of the auditorium. And Zubin Mehta finally came down from the stage and sat down and buried his face in his hands. He didn't know what to do with himself. In fact, he was emotionally upset and close to tears. Never, never ever before in his entire career had he received such a reception. About 15 minutes later, somebody tapped him on the shoulder. He lifted his head. His chauffeur was beckoning, beckoning him. Sir, it's time for us to go. Zubin Mehta got up and gathered his belongings and left. They walked out of the exit. And friends, when he stepped out of the auditorium, there were 8,000 people standing and waiting for him. They had formed a human pathway with a diplomatic corps standing on either side of the aisle. And as he walked down the aisle, 8,000 people spontaneously broke out in thunderous applause. You see, Zubin Mehta didn't know that in Prague, the custom is not to clap during the performance itself. Appreciation is demonstrated only after the, the performance is complete. Oh, brothers and sisters, Jesus will come to your house all too soon. And he comes to those who have not desired earthly applause. The Bible tells me that there is going to be a day when 10,000 times 10,000 will come. The diplomatic core of heaven and our atmosphere will resound with the words, Come, you blessed of my Father. I like your foundation. I like your foundation. You have built on the rock. You have weathered the winds and the storms of life. Those storms that have caused some, that have caused some from among us to fall, and give up on their faith, will not be able to shake those who have truly built on the rock. Dear friends, the church of God will go through. The big question is, will you go through with it? Herein lies our hope for the end time when Jesus comes to fetch his own. Our oh, friends, may we place our priorities in the right place. May we not just hear the words of Jesus, but put them into practice. May we not just hear the truth, but walk in the truth and walk in the light. May we practice the principles of God's kingdom as expounded, in the Sermon on the Mount. May we allow the Holy Spirit to bear His fruit in our lives every day. Our oh, friends, may God help us to that end, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads as we close. Our kind, our gracious, Heavenly Father, everywhere we turn, we see society crumbling. The birth pangs are there. The baby is soon to be born. You are soon to come. Oh God, we realize that our characters are the only things that we're going to take with us. Everything else gets left behind. Lord, help us to realize the seriousness of building a character that is fit for your kingdom. 
Forgive us for our apathy and indifference in the past. With your help, dear Lord, and the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to change our attitude. We give our hearts to you afresh right now. Take us, Lord, and use us. Help us to walk in your light and in your truth. Help us to practice what we believe. Is my sincere prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you all. And may you remain faithful to him so that you may see him face to face one day. Amen. There is a name I love to whisper any time of day. It's mentioned No tongue can tell No pen can write Whisper Jesus I love you Jesus Heaven's peace will flood your soul whisper Jesus I love you Jesus heaven's peace will flood your soul and if we then would please our master Jesus, heaven's peace.